Why would a filmmaker become interested in C.S. Lewis? On today's show, we're going to talk with veteran British producer and director Norman Stone, who's behind a wonderful new movie about the life of C.S. Lewis. I'm John West, Managing Director of the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute. Thank you for joining us today. C.S. Lewis is one of the most beloved authors in the English language, from his Narnian chronicles to theological works like Mere Christianity to his adult science fiction novels like That Hideous Strength. Lewis's works continue to exert a powerful influence on our culture. I'm delighted to have on our show today filmmaker Norman Stone, who has a new movie out on C.S. Lewis that will be in theaters on Wednesday, November 3rd. The film is called The Most Reluctant Convert, The Untold Story of C.S. Lewis. It tells of Lewis's journey from scientific atheism to theism to Christianity. You can get tickets at cslewismovie.com. That's cslewismovie.com. Norman Stone is a storied filmmaker in England who's had a fascinating career. He began his professional life in television as the youngest producer-director at the BBC. He's done multiple projects on C.S. Lewis, which we'll get get to, but he's also done many other movies and shows, including films about Martin Luther and Florence Nightingale, two Agatha Christie Miss Marple movies, uh, and even an adaptation of a story by the great Russian novelist Dostoevsky. In the process, he's directed many of the film industry's top actors and actresses, including Dirk Bogard, Peter O'Toole, Claire Bloom, Jonathan Price, Helena Bonham Carter, Lee Remick, uh, Jeremy Irons, many others. Norman Stone has won awards from the British Academy of Film and Television Arts and an international Emmy. Norman, it's a privilege to be able to talk with you today. My pleasure. Let's right. talk. <laughs> so you've done four film projects, I think, focused on C.S. Lewis, starting with the British version of the play Shadowlands, which is sort of a fictionalized story, but based on Lewis's real-life poignant marriage to Joy Gresham, who died of cancer, and it's, I will say, more accurate than the later Hollywood version. Um, but why your preoccupation with Lewis? This is now four projects. Well, it began quite simply because I went freelance from the BBC, and I'd just done my first drama uh, about a blind and deaf Cornish poet living in Cornwall, as I say, on the edge of a clay pit, and I thought, he was a great Christian guy, but he hadn't seen or heard for 25 years. But he earned the right to be heard, strangely, through that suffering. To When he talked, you listened. My goodness, you listened. So uh, when I went freelance, I thought, well, that was great. He got an award and things. And I thought, who else has earned the right to be heard? It didn't take long for me to think of C.S. Lewis, of course. And that's what became the original Shadowlands. Later, it became the play. And then after oh, that, okay. again... It, yeah, and after okay. that it became the feature film. Although uh, I appreciate your comments on the original one, I, I thought the feature film was great, but it was rather mm -hmm. like a rather like a nicely built Laguna car, except they left the engine out. Um, it was <laughs> they, they rather downplayed the faith, uh, which is um, understandable when you saw where Dickie Attenborough, the director, was coming from in his own personal life. But um, it didn't go the whole mile, as you might say. Well, and it, it, it built up the faith just so it could punch it down. You know, that his faith was shallow and, and other things until the end. I mean, I have, again, I, I think you did a, a fine job with it. And, I, and William Nicholson is a very gifted uh, script writer and then playwright. Um, thank you for getting it that the, your film was first, even before the play. I, I do think... Um, and obviously things have to be fictionalized, and I get that. Uh, I, I do think that some of the things, it's just interesting on Lewis's story, as you may or may not know, although Joy Gresham is the person everyone talks about, the, the, the sort of idea that that was the first woman that he was seriously involved in, and you know, he had been cloistered away from the world, at least this came out more in the Hollywood version, is just really not true biographically. In fact, he had the person he told his friend George Sayer before he met Joy Gresham that if he was going to marry, it was a poet, another poetess, an English poetess, Ruth Pitter. And whom he had a multiple year, uh, very deep friendship with and returned to after his wife's death. Well, you're a great gumshoe on Lewis's heart. So I, <laughs> I would, uh, I'm learning things today. No, I, that's true. And certainly he wasn't closeted away from the world. Heaven help us. The Inklings and their marching from pub to pub was a, um, a wonderful, refreshing time when they could uh, talk and walk, as they'd say. 
Well, and as in one of your projects, you bring home that he had kids who act, you know, the other idea is, well, he had no contact with kids. Well, he had three teenage girls come and live with him during the war. And uh, one of whom ultimately ended, uh, I think, married the son or son of Sigmund Freud, she became a Jill Fluitt Freud, yes. became a distinguished actor. So, I mean, he had a I've lot I've seen more. her castle. Her castle is up okay. north, just, just near Wick. So, I mean, so he wasn't closeted away. And of course, you've covered his thing in, in World War One. So this idea that he was just an ivory tower academic and until this is really the Hollywood version of uh, sure. Shadowlands that he had nothing before was so closeted away from the real world and real pain other than his mother's death just wasn't accurate. But anyway, uh, sure. it's interesting, yeah. isn't it? The, uh, the, the, the you have the Hollywood version of him and you have the Christian version of him, which sometimes also takes liberties. You know, I always thought yeah. it would be a bad thing if they put C.S. Lewis in a stained glass window. He would, it wasn't that sort at all. Then I mm. went to Headington Church, which was his church, of course, and right next to the pew that he used to sit and worship in, there yep, is a stained glass window to I've C.S. Lewis. <laughs> I've been there. I've seen it. Um, the yeah. other thing, actually, which is in your Beyond Narnia, but it's, and I don't, again, fault you for this, because Lewis scholars, some are very protective, and this only came out more recently, but his relationship with Patty Moore's mother did not start off as this uh it, it was a it was a sexual affair and, and we now yeah. know that was denied for many years and then it really it, it's it's true now i think there's something as a christian I, I actually think there's something really powerful about that because after he became a christian he of course ended that but he then did take care of her for the rest of her life including when she sort yeah. of went off and visiting her in the in the nursing home every day and so that showed his faithfulness to commitments even i mean i i think it's, yeah. it's a really poignant I think, story I, I think Mrs. Moore, uh, Minto as they called her, of yes. course, uh, I think Mrs. Moore did not like him becoming a Christian. His conversion was, yeah. was true, strong and uh, lasting, of course, as conversions are. But uh, but when they when they were re re renovating the old kilns where he used to live, a house called the Kilns, they discovered the bolt on the door and had been bol bolted over. And he built a staircase because he had to go through that room to get to the final room and it, the upstairs bedroom, as you know. Yeah. And the staircase is outside. He went down yeah. and in his own front door to go to the kitchen, really, which was. Uh, it's interesting. That was just him standing by his beliefs, absolutely. And uh, you know probably as much as I do, more than I do, about how Mrs. Moore um, reacted to that. She was being left behind. Yeah, she became increasingly tyrannical. Um, but but again, that, that's a poignant story of how he, he did uphold uh, he was faithful. The affair ended, he was faithful, and so I think yeah. that that's something. And also, well, let, let's get to you know two of your previous Lewis projects, Shadowlands and Beyond Narnia, focused primarily on telling Lewis's life story or part of it. So, what got you interested in doing the Most Reluctant Convert, which is yet another biopic about Lewis? Surely, you know, you, you've already said all you needed to say in the first two ones. You think I don't, you don't know me? I've never I've ever said all I want to say or I need to say. Um, no, it's true. I didn't. I, I suppose I would have thought second about it. I uh, thought carefully about it if I'd um, if I thought we were just going to do a repeat. But I was phoned up by a friend of mine called Max McLean, who mm -hmm. I'd known for some years and uh, an actor, actor manager, got his own company in New York. Very good. Um, and he was on, a, on his way a long evening or night drive, I think, down to a theater halfway down America. It took some time. I think he was bored. Anyway, he phoned me, hopefully on hands-free phones. Uh, and he said, um, I'm going down to do this um, this one-man show, uh, which, of course, he'd culled from Lewis's own writings and speech. And he said, and it's going really, really well. Do you think it'll stand a chance on um, ever getting on the screen, Norman? And I say, well, I've not seen the show, Max. It's uh, it's always about the script. Uh, he said, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. And after I put the phone down from that conversation, I thought, what have I done? He's a good friend. You don't ask really good friends blind to send a script that they care about a lot. What if it's awful? Mm. And it arrived, and I didn't look at it for a couple of days, thinking, hmm. And then I looked at it, and it was brilliant. And I've said this to Max, of course it was brilliant. You used Lewis's words, uh, and it was very true to him. And I really thought this is great stuff. But you couldn't do it as a piece of theatre, uh, unless you just wanted to point the camera at a stage, and, th and that wouldn't really be good. 
So he gave me complete creative freedom. He was the chap that could find the money and the way to do this. Uh, I got six weeks to uh, reinvent that uh, one man show, but as a piece of cinema or uh, streamer or, te or television, I guess, to broadcast. And when I did that, it began to come alive all over again. It, it, it was like getting back to the original Shadowlands, which is probably my, orig my, my best, most enjoyed film that I've ever done. Um, and suddenly this was coming off the page. And then the next thing you know, Max wanted to be in it. First, he didn't want to, then he read it and he said, I want to be in this. And he didn't tell me until we were going on set for the first day that he'd never been on camera before. I said, what? <laughs> you know, we'd talked, we'd run lines, we'd done all that stuff. And he'd never been performing on camera before, but he does a fantastic job. And we sort of doing it in the middle of lockdown with a very tight schedule and not that much money. We just threw ourselves at it with no hold backs and we did our jobs and he and I got on really well. And I think the film works. Um, you've seen the film it's it, it takes creative uh, if not chances it, it borrows a bit from dickens i think in mm -hmm. christmas carol uh, you'll see that when oh. you see the film anyone but it, it's um it seems to pack a punch which i'm very happy to say that it does um and i hope people enjoy it see it and what's more i hope we swing open the library doors again yeah. to mr lewis's pure thinking and honesty in the books he's written. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a wonderful story and you did a great job of opening up a sta one man stage play to an actual film, which can be a challenge. Um, you interest me when you just said that Max originally didn't necessarily want to be in it. At that point, were you planning on, um, I mean, now, I mean, Max, you made the reference to Dickens. I mean, you basically you have the older guy showing him, sort of guiding you through the story, but other actors. Was the original idea to do just a straight um, dramatic film with the actors and not with anyone sort of guiding well, you through the story? Well, I, it wasn't my idea with that, but when I did my thinking and was allowed that way, I... I was falling in, in love with the one that we did, but I went back to him and I said, look, we've got three choices. You can either take the audience to a theater and, and, and then film the theater up front stage when they're not there and do the cutaways of the audience and so on. And he said, but that's not what interests me. He said, no, I could do that, couldn't I? I said, yes, you could. So the second way I said is to do one man shows. I've done a fair few of them and film when you break the fourth wall, as they call it, and you, no. you can look straight through the camera. It's very powerful. And you set it on location. So there's real breath hanging in the cold air and so on. Mm -hmm. And that can be really good. But I'd done quite a few of those and it didn't feel like a challenge. No. And he said, OK, what's the third one? And I said, oh, that's the dangerous one. And if ever you want to get somebody like Max to say, I want to do this, just say, that's the dangerous one. And he said, what's that? What's that? And I told him, because I'm thinking it started about this, rather like the ghost of Christmas past that takes um, Scrooge back to the childhood when he was the last little boy in the school at Christmas. Remember that? I always wow. found that more, more uh, moving. Mm -hmm. because he was watching himself doing it. We were watching the beginning of a repentant man. So... Um, I said, and I went through the, the ideas and he said, no, no, I love that. I love that. I love that. So then I finished the six weeks and we had the yeah. script. Um, and I'm glad we did that. I didn't feel bored for one minute making it. And I don't think you'll feel bored for watching it. No, I don't think people will. OK, um, our audience, uh, listeners, uh, viewers are particularly interested in the relationship between science and faith. And Lewis's relationship with science is certainly one of the themes running throughout your film. You start him off with, you know, Lewis talking about really being the bold scientific atheist, but then he eventually abandons that belief that science somehow refutes God. Uh, one key scene is where he and his friend Owen Barfield, and I think this has played really well, uh, debate whether unguided evolution can just explain the human mind. And Lewis thinks it can, his friend thinks it's not. And that's actually very true to Lewis's actual views and, and debates. Um, so I don't know. I mean, you, you, you did reframe things. Why did you think, or, or did you think, that Lewis's relationship with science was an important part of the story uh, to tell? Well, I wasn't doing an exposition on Lewis. I wasn't doing an overview and so on. But if you want to know how this guy got to become a Christian, it's fairly key. Mm -hmm. 
I love the fact that Lewis is so honest. I, I, I get the feeling he would have put his chin out to be hit, even if he knew it was going to hurt. But if it was true, he had to do it. He didn't back off, pretend, wrap it in sugar, whatever you want. He, he would follow a thing through. Now, that debate with Owen Barfield had been going on for some time and went on for some months. These guys sat in uh, Maudley College, Oxford, and just would talk away and argue away. Sometimes they'd even pick intellectual fights with each other, but they'd make each other think. As the Bible says, when iron sharpens iron, so the wits of men show the sharpen wits of men. So when Barfield comes out as a hardened atheist, like Lewis thought he was on safe ground with Barfield, he's already getting a bit convicted that things aren't quite as he thought they might be. And Barfield turns up. I like that scene too. It's very much, it's shot in Magdalene College in the, the rooms. And the, and he says, but you know, do you think in this? Yes. Do you think a reason? Yes. He said, but if there's nothing, if it's random atoms colliding in skulls, the whole game's changed. How can you trust your, your reason? Now, I didn't therefore explain that as a as a fascinating uh, theory or argument, because I was just concerned on how Lewis went across the stepping stones, honest, strong stepping stones of coming to faith. And that is one of the most honest and strong ones. I love it. It'd be fascinating to explore that more. But the that's my interest in that at that point. Lewis, when you when you get to know Lewis, and I, I never met him, of course, um, but um, I remember him dying. I remember the same day as John F. Kennedy in 63. I remember that. But I, you read him, you read his books of various sorts. You, you must know this. You get to know him. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that C.S. Lewis, especially when the Christians come and try and put him in a holy box, mm -hmm. I think he was a thinker and a pusher for things and in being extremely honest with his own thoughts and then with other people's thoughts. He, he, he was, um, you can't play with Lewis and pretend he wasn't. It, the trouble with the second Shadowlands that won the Oscars, they tried to make Lewis in their own image a bit much. He doesn't yeah. fit that very well. And sometimes, you know, I was talking to people who knew him in my, my very first film on Lewis, the original Shadowlands, and they said, oh, he was considered a very dangerous person by the church. I said, what? He said, oh, he was, con he was a loose cannon. He could come out and say mm. anything. Well, good for Lewis. Yeah. And, you know, he's still saying everything. There's close on a quarter of a billion books being sold of his thinking and wit writing so far, as you yep. must know. Yep. That's quite a lot. He's selling more every year. He tells the truth in a, re in a readable and understandable way. So I didn't specialize in science or one or the other. I was following his, sure. his pilgrimage. Sure. Great. Uh, early on in the film, uh, where Lewis is talking about how science reinforces his atheism. You have him strolling through the Natural History Museum with these animal skeletons all around him and even a statue of Darwin sort of looking down. I thought that was delicious. I mean, just a, a really <laughs> interesting picture. Who came up with that idea? Was that yours for using that setting? To that was that was what I wrote in. In fact, it's the Oxford Natural History and Science yeah. Museum. Yes. Um, and yeah, well, I, I, I wrote the script. So I decided <laughs> it, it, people have got to see the film. It's creatively free, yes. shall we say. Yeah. He can watch himself in his earlier past he can tell us and they the past gets recreated and then you start getting a bit strange because he then is in the same scenes as himself almost yeah. finishing his own sentences or getting yeah. shocked by the memory yeah. and that to me is it i'm getting goosebumps talking about it. It, it 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 sets something alive and electric going in storytelling so well he starts i don't want to give the whole thing away but sure. there's a there's a point when he introduces his original atheism and then he walks through a door he, and you could end up anywhere there that was what thrilled me I, I just loved that and he opens another door and he's in the middle of the natural history and science museum with more dinosaurs yep. bones that you can shake a stick at yep. and it just fitted what lewis was saying my job at that point was to illustrate poetically or dynamically what Lewis in the script of the most reluctant convert on stage, what he was saying, and I can do more than that. I can take you to locations and to places and to thinking yeah. and get to know him. So that's that's how that happened. But you should try it. It's great fun. Yeah. It's absolutely I, I, I agree. Wonderful. And I think people will, will, will love it. And uh, especially on that, because he's talking about how, I mean, science is a wonderful thing, but he was talking about people who are trying to abuse science to 
to really preach a very bleak view of the world. And so you're sort of seeing that as, as he's talking, it's just, especially the skeletons, because they're dead things. And so, you know, that's their view of the world. And you that was his it. view you of the world. It. And so, yeah. anyway, we're coming up on Halloween in the United States. I don't know how much that's... Uh, we uh, don't really bother as much as you yeah. guys. You're, you're dynamic. There's one house in my Scottish village, I'm talking from Scotland, which has done decorations outside. That's it. I one. guess you, you have Guy Fox there, I guess. Anyway, I, I thought it would be appropriate to remark that another thing you cover in this, which, which I think most people really don't know about is Lewis's attraction and repulsion by the occult. Um, and why did you think that that was important? Uh, I of course mean, it's important. Yeah. He's, if you look through him, his own writings, I mean, many people would be surprised about what we talked about with Mrs. Moore, his, um, yeah. his, his fighting mate comrade in the First World War who died. Others would be amazed at the fact that he got so fascinated by the occult. And people mm -hmm. can yeah, it is, yeah. especially at the time, at that time in the 20s and the 30s, and even before then, I think Lewis had, uh, even when he was at school, with that, you know his story, yeah. with the, uh, and the nurse that, uh, yes. that uh, helped him in the younger, younger years. It, it, he felt that that was, he wanted to be free rather than bound, I think, as well, and that attracted yeah. him. And he, interestingly, his own words, he says he still has trouble with it. Yeah. And it's about power. And yeah. it's about darkness and being different and being a rebel and all that. So that's what, what was it. I think he describes it very well in the script, which comes directly from the stage script that was pulled together by Max. Uh, and I think it's very fair to what he believed. But if you don't have darkness, you don't know light. I don't mean to sound, I don't mean to sound trite. Yeah. Yeah. But I think in Lewis's case, in certain cases, it really helped him. I and mean, look at that hideous strength, the book, uh, uh, third yes. in the science fiction trilogy. Um, but I think that he, again, was honest and honest and honest. Therefore, when he was pulled and intrigued by this darker, stickier area, he really understood George MacDonald's book, Fantasties, yeah. because there was lightness. And there's that wonderful phrase which Max does so well in the film. Um, he, he says, uh, what is it he said? He said, um, oh, yes, on that night when i read fantasties my imagination was baptized the rest of me of course took a little longer yeah, yeah that now, was wonderful. how could I, how could i not put that if i'm following my job is to follow his, his pathway yeah. through to faith that's a big moment yeah. Well, I think it also, you well said that at the time when he was living, there was a lot of this attraction to spiritualism, these other things, uh, I would say, you know, unhealthy things uh, spiritually, but it's an interesting counterpoint to the scientific materialism. So, you know, if you feel that science, and science doesn't show this, but that science sort of preaches this bleak materialism, we're just matter in motion, people are still desiring something more. And so uh, that may not just be healthy things like Christianity. There's a, there's a bad side to spirituality. And so you see, you know, as you point out, at the time that he was living, there were a lot of people who were struggling for meaning and finding something more. And they were yeah. going to things that were very unhealthy. And that was part of his journey. And of course, I, I know, I'm sure you know about his book, The Pil Pilgrim's Regress, where he sort of gives an autobiographical in fiction allegory form of his trying all sorts of various things. And then uh, what you may or may not know about um, is his book, his narrative poem, Dimer, which he actually wrote in the 1920s when he wasn't a Christian yet, but was had just flipped from being a materialist that almost is like a, a pre-Christian version of the Pilgrim's Regress, where he gives the same story of someone going through yeah. all these different things. Well, um, I, I sometimes feel sorry for the scientists these days with their limited view. I... I, I they're fighting such an uphill battle because the more they tell us that all we are is this, this is only that, the heart is just a bump, the head is only you know, a, a computer of the brain, and so on and so forth, everything's only something. You can say that all you want, but it takes a particular sort of diehard to agree with that without denying what is inside our souls and spirits. We know there's something more. Heavens, that's why we've never stopped having religions of one sort or another, whichever culture you're in. Yeah. And I think the um, the idea that this is it. I mean, for me, the you know what I think is the greatest statement of faith I've ever read? What? It's um, death is just the turning out of lights. 
Bertrand Russell said that. Mm. Wow, I bow in awe at his faith. <laughs> I can't, but I can't match that. Of course, Christianity for Bertrand Russell was not worthy of inspection because it, there was no proof. There was no evidence. Mm. Sorry, Bertrand. Death is just a turning out of mm. lights. Come on. Mm. And yet, for a long time, that influenced so many people and there were brain trusts, as we used to call them on the BBC over here in 1950s radio and everything. We, everything was only something and we could get on and do it. We were going to get better. Did you know that? How's that going, by the way? <laughs> yeah. You know, it is sort of, I mean, you look back at Bertrand Russell and many others from the 19th and the early 20th centuries. Um, it's sort of this innocent, naive materialism that they think that, you know, science has now discovered everything and, and we're just, you know, blind molecules in process. And then you look at what happened in the century after that from you know, mainstream science coming to the conclusion that the universe wasn't eternal, had an actual beginning in the Big Bang. Well, what does that sound like? That you actually, the material universe started from something that was non-material by definition, because if it began, you know, there had to be something non-material before. And I, then you, I can, uh, I'm seeing your expertise, it's showing. <laughs> well, and then just inside ourselves, just in the last, say, 50 years, the finding of nanotechnology, these little molecular machines that that I mean, scientists call molecular machines that far outstrip human nanotechnology. Oh, yeah, that just came together through some sort of unguided process. I mean, it is it really uh, the, the last century has basically done a lot to itself, just the, the, the factual data to, to undercut that naive materialism coming out of the 19th century, um, which Lewis grew yeah. up in and then ended up, you know, re rejecting. So your film is beautifully shot, I think, beautifully scored, uh, well acted. Was it filmed all around Oxford? I know you had some scenes yeah, set yeah, in North okay. Oxford. Yeah. So even we the scenes in Northern that were set in Northern Ireland were just filmed around Oxford because I thought. Yeah, we. I looked at the house. You've seen the photographs, and so you may have even been there in in in, uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, and I found something similar. Yeah. But an awful lot of the places um, were the actual places, which actually gave the crew the crew got fascinated in this it's one of kenneth branner's crews he's a the okay. famous director yes. of britain uh, so we're using some of the best people uh, but they got fascinated they were talking on it about it during their lunch breaks because lewis's words are strong and this is a lot of words of lewis coming straight across them um there's a making of film get a chance to see that you'll see one or two other people getting excited it's just that it, it, they had never come across this lewis was Aslan, the, the lion, and Narnia, and that yeah. was it. But they, again, swing open the library doors. Mm -hmm. But I, I particularly like Magdalen College, which they were very kind for us there. Uh, there were lots of places. I mean, the Headington Qu Quarry Church, uh, we filmed in his church, of course, there. And of yeah. course, you go outside, and there's his grave. But um, no, the, I, I couldn't use Lewis's actual rooms, which years ago. Mm. I saw uh, in their real state when I was doing Shadowlands, but we didn't do that then. It was a different story. We didn't need his his college rooms. Now it's been changed completely and painted white and filled with computers and everything else. So I went with the bursar, who was very helpful, and we found a lookalike pair of rooms in the same block. It was the same, okay. what they called the new buildings, because they were built in 1774 or something. But it's, it's a wonderful Oxford Colleges. So we went to where we could, and that was Addison's Walk that he and yep. Tolkien went up and so on. Good. Yep. It yep. was... It was very satisfying, although very tight in, in budget and schedule. Yes, I, I was. Uh, uh, it, for anyone who's been to Oxford, and I have there, and so it was. It's very authentic, and it gives you a chance to see that. That's something you can't do in a play or, or reading to see Lewis in his environment, and and that is from the pub to the the church where I've been as well. I think is wonderful, and I do think you find for the house in the Northern Ireland that you found something that looked very similar. That's why I yes. actually asked. It was I thought well as part of part of my job. Yeah. So now. So where is the making of documentary available? Because I don't think I saw it on the website. Do you? Um, I don't know. They plan to show it on the third. Maybe they're keeping it. Because okay. Um, okay. When, when we made the film, I didn't shoot this as a feature film. Though it seems to be getting a lot of attraction yeah. as a feature film. And I'm glad it looks that good. I had a great camera. Um, very good. Um, Sam Heisman. A young guy is just a genius. I want to work with him again immediately. Um, so 
when we went around the places, it looked as good as it could be. But when you show it in a cinema, which will be happening in 300 cities in America, I believe, on the 3rd of November, it's only 74 minutes long or something, this yeah. film. Yeah. So, so if you add the making of film, which is about 15, 17 minutes or whatever, you get a great 90-minute show around. Okay. And I tried this in a screening over here, and I played the making of film first. And it was like the appetizer because it's a well-made film. We've got lots of people talking about it and, and who are involved in it. You see the whole thing and you can't wait. Then what happens next? And then you stop and play the film. And now you watch it through uh, hungry eyes. Put yeah. it that way. Well, um, I'm looking forward to it. I already have my tickets uh, for, for it. Uh, even though I've seen it as a screener, I, I want to see it on the big screen. Um, so I think... Max McLean is the older Lewis, it's pitch perfect. In fact, for anyone who's even heard a recording of the actual C.S. Lewis, Max's depiction actually is pretty reminiscent even of that voice and obviously his persona. So I think he steals the show when he's on the screen, but I think the actor that you've cast as the 20-something C.S. Lewis also steals the screen. His name is Nicholas Ralph. I think most people are so used to thinking of Lewis as he was later in life that Ralph's portrayal is really gonna get them to see Lewis in a whole new way, what he was like when he was a young professor. Tell us who he is, because I don't think he's that well known in America yet, and how you can- Oh, he's massively him. known in America, it turns out. He's been okay. on the cover of the Rolling Stone or something oh, similar. Oh, well, now I'm, show now I'm showing my parochialism, so. <laughs> no, it was, it was, I couldn't find the right, I couldn't find a Lewis. And can you, and not the middle of this, not the guy that went from atheism to faith in the middle of his life, went to the First World War and so on. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't find one. And the time was ticking by. And um, I had seven days to go and still no Lewis. I'd been seeing so many people. I needed them to look like Lewis as much as I can, if you look at the early photos, and also have that ambiance. And my wife, God bless my wife, my wife was watching television and there's a new series just started, a reboot of a thing called Old Creatures Great and Small. Mm -hmm. It hadn't come to America yet. And she said, this guy's great. He actually turned out later to be very good friends of friends of ours. We didn't know. Oh. Uh, and I didn't have an idea who he was. He came from Scotland and had been living in Glasgow, which is near where I live, and never met him. And she said, this is the man you should want. And as soon as I looked at him, there's a black and white photograph of Lewis at that, that age sitting in a chair. Yeah. It's the cross between Prince Charles and him, sort of, yeah. in a way. I said, yeah. wow, he's the closest thing I've ever seen. What is this guy? Who is this guy? And within two days, maximum three, I'd signed him up because we only had like four more days to go or something similar before we had to go there for, for immediate preparation. And he was wonderful, is wonderful. I'll happily work with him on any other things. What he did was he got it. He understood it immediately. He's a very good actor. And then when All Creatures Great and Small came over to America on PBS, it took the place by storm. I seriously have never seen, because it surprised me, and I'd already got him in the can, mm -hmm. but up came these huge publicity tranches of stuff, photographs, as I say, Rolling Stone, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it came at a time when everyone was wanting to watch that. You had the great attack on Capitol Hill and so on, and, and nobody wanted reality. They wanted to go back to a countryside 19, what is it, 40s, I guess, um, countryside story in, in rural Britain. Uh, so he's now really high. He's just had got no. two more series of that um, commissioned. But he was wonderful, and he got it. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, but McLean and Ralph, they make the film. I mean, it just the, it lights up with them. And I did notice that he looked somewhat similar. To, I know the photo you're talking about. Yeah, no, yes, I thought you might. Well done. So, well done. No one's um, ever said that to me. <laughs> OK. Um, now, as we begin to wrap up, I, I don't want to give any real spoilers in the film, but I can't help commenting on the way you begin and end the film, which Max McLean told me was purely your idea, without saying more. And we could sort of talk around this. <laughs> it's sort of a fun tribute to all those who put on a show for audiences. Um, and I just wondered, you know, without, you don't have to give the details, but what were you trying to communicate with your opening and close? I thought it was, I was joyous. Trying to go, <laughs> I was trying to go through the veil. I have a theory, um, especially when you're doing television, actually. You, you, you know, you watch TV, you, you go to a cinema, right? And you go, the, the lights go down, it's black, there's a big screen surrounded by sound. This is 
brainwashing time, folks. You're concentrating purely on one thing. You go to television and the phone rings. Your neighbor comes around to borrow a cup of sugar. Somebody's um, doing something upstairs. Could you be quiet, please? I can't hear. Whatever it is, interruptions happen, including dinner. So um, you have to grab an audience they've just been watching commercials or a comedy show or news grab that audience and i call it going through the veil so you go through into that space and if you do it well enough they stay with you and forget the neighbor and the phone and where you watch it and and i think that works so in this instance whether it's on cinema or in or streamer or broadcast i wanted to make sure that book ends if you like i'm still telling a story nobody believes with all your kind words that this is c.s lewis walking towards the camera of course it isn't we all know that why don't we make something useful of that something artist something fun with that that as a secondary thought much later somebody was saying but max is a, an american how can he how can he possibly play english and it is true that certain English people who are very well tuned in these affairs uh, would um, probably understand that he's got American touches here and there. But I, I also got with the beginning, which we can't tell you what it is, uh, I get through that because he is seen as an American actor, worried mm. about his hair and his, in the, the lines and all these different things. That's what he's seen as. Therefore, bang, you've got the game, set, and match. But I think also that introduces you to what is on a one man show and you take in the theater is a lot of talking. You have a guy who is going to talk to you through the camera. Yes, you get wonderful drama. I hope it's wonderful. Yes, you get these other experiences. But if you go through that veil and get on the train and it pulls out of the station, you're going to have to listen and live with as if you're getting to know him personally, C.S. Lewis as he goes on through. Now, the 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 technique at the front the 90 seconds or whatever is part of getting through the veil but also getting into what otherwise could be extremely boring it's it's lewis's speech standing up max beat it in the theater no. i had to beat it on screen hmm. well you did a great job um <coughs> any more lewis projects up your sleeve what about a, <laughs> what about a film adaptation of something you actually mentioned which is one of my favorite lewis novels which is that hideous strength I've just read it with that in mind, and then I read it again with that in mind. I don't think it will work. Mm. I see your disappointment. I'll tell you why. It isn't the best written book. It is certainly great fun, and some of the characters he just plays with and has fun with them. He doesn't go into depth. And at the same time, it's very 1930s, rather like in that science fiction trilogy space travel i'm afraid is oh, not yeah, yeah, no. walking around naked with yeah, metal no, weights yeah, on a yeah. circular yeah, station like, yeah. so you can't do that and be taken seriously uh you could find it highly entertaining but no one would take it seriously i'll tell you what could work you could but whether it'd be worth doing it this way but it's a great story and it challenges great things i i thought i'd got it once in the 70s when i was thinking of all the cults that were coming up i did a film about a cult called synanon the oh, archetypal yes. cult yeah. um, and i thought what if a, a cult took over a, 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 an oxford college and so on how would that work and it could almost but what i think we should do if you do anything at all is take that story essence idea and underlying thread all the way through because he's onto a good seam of gold there but modernize it completely just say based on not say this is an interpretation uh, this is a, a, an actual copy of this is an interpretation of that underlying thing and you could do it quite well whether it would look anything um like the original is almost irrelevant if the story works well it certainly sell a lot because there's his name being attached to it and they'd give you grace or criticism accordingly but i don't think it's something that is as simple as we wish it would be there are many subjects for films in my life mm. that i wish things were easier to do but there are others you could do 
Well, certainly modernizing it and updating and, and sort of making it a different situation is, is one way to go. It could also, there are great sort of classes. There, there's, I think there's still a lot of fascination with the 1930s, 40s as a part of... You'd have to uh, rework his history. wording totally, though. You'd have yeah. to rework his wording. The severed head could stay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'd say that the, the underlying thing, of, I guess... I'm a former uh, tenured college professor. I just say that actually the, the, the sorts of both influences and the sort of inner ring influence of, of always wanting to get into you know, where the power is, that's really a great description of academia even today. And certainly with um, the authority of science and claims made in the name of science uh, yeah, on the part of government yeah, nice. and, rich, rich and propaganda therapy. in the media and other things and, and people who believe things in the media that that maybe in their own personal experience doesn't bear out. I mean, those themes are huge today. And so I'd say, yeah, it, um, but you'd have to you'd have to cut the tether with the original story and let it sail onto somewhere where you could hit hard, hit real hard. And I you mean, could do that. I mean, you, you could, could maybe even move it from not to the modern day. You could move it to like the 1950s, post World War II, because in fact, even though it was written during uh, World War II, uh, it was sort of vaguely after the war, and so 50s and 60s, and that actually, uh, I mean, a lot of the themes there, people were struggling with, with the atom bomb, other stuff, you know, science and science and faith, science and government power. But you could do a, a completely different one. But I, I think, I don't know, it, it could be. A... I'll tell you what you probably could do better. Shall I tell you? Sure. Radio. Radio drama is so much more, so much less costly. Well, that's true. Yet, I, yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's an issue of doing, setting it in an earlier period would be. Yeah, but, well, there was a lady costly. when BBC was first moving from radio to television. And there was a, a well-known interview uh, at that time, very, very pucker, very BBC. And they were telling, asking people what they thought of the new television. And uh, people were saying, oh, very nice. Oh, yeah, very, didn't think I'd have that in my room. All this. And they got to one old lady and she said, don't like it. And said, sorry, madam, what, what do you mean you don't like it? She said, well, um, it's not as good. And they said, why is it not as good? And she said, on radio, the pictures are better. <laughs> and she was right. Yeah. She was absolutely right. I could tell you a line of drama and you would see it in your head, be it 20,000 charging soldiers, and you've got it, and you measure it and fit it like a bespoke suit to your own person. A case in but point, I'm a filmmaker. Yeah, case in point, Brian Sibley, I know you've done things with him. His radio adaptation of The Chronicles of Narnia are far superior in my view to any Yes, other, I think it was. I think it was. So Brian anyway, was my best man at my wedding. Okay, I know you've done some projects with him. Another interest of mine actually is Walt Disney, and I know you did a documentary. Uh, oh, thank goodness so, you've gone into Yeah, with Brian, that was good. Anyway, so any more Lewis projects up your sleeve? Uh, we talked about, yeah. Um, we're discussing things. I. Two things. Lewis said, and this is a, a, a tangential a little bit, Lewis said, we don't want more Christian books. We want more Christians who write books. And I could agree that on every level I agree with that. And when you think it's true, there's a gravitational pull towards Lewis in America like I've never seen. <laughs> it's, it's a money ticket in a way to put his name on. That is not good. But if we get other writers who are good, Mm -hmm. and writing books and so on, he would want us to support them, totally. Mm -hmm. We yep. do tend to get locked up into the saintly one only person, and I think he would hate that. Um, oh. But there are things you can do. It's so clearly, what we're, if, we had, if I or Max and I or whatever are going to think of doing other stuff up ahead, not because of guaranteed publicity, because you use the magic name of Lewis, there are ideas he struggled with, books he wrote, uh, mm -hmm. ideas he came up with and characters he developed, um, which which are not just Chronicles of Narnia at all. They're, they're, they're great, but, it, you know, the, you, there are stuff that can go to, but usually it is a challenge. Can I tell you one of my main uh, messages to people who have a Christian faith who look at television and, or film and get excited? Mm -hmm. They say early on in my career, they said, oh, just think of the potential. Think of the potential of television and Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, think of limitation. 
Because when you understand the limitation, what it can do or cannot do, then you've got the full potential. Mm. And they often wouldn't get it. But it's true. You, you don't shout at people through a megaphone when they need whispering to. You, you, you've got to say in your with your hand on your heart, that this is so important to actually be Christian in what you do rather than um, say potential, potential, potential. If there was such a thing as a five second Jesus commercial that would have the nation on its knees, I wouldn't believe it. And it would be a terrible thing to pursue. We are meant to be there telling the truth in a God centered world and the rest follows. I'm getting on my little tub now and talking to you. Well, but I think Lewis agrees with that. Yeah, I, I think so too. And that is a great place on which to end. I want to thank you for a delightful conversation. <laughs> uh, we have been talking with filmmaker Norman Stone about his wonderful new uh, film, The Reluctant Convert, about the life of C.S. Lewis. You can see it in theaters on the night of November 3rd, and you can get tickets at cslewismovie.com. That's cslewismovie.com. I'd really encourage you to go and take your friends. I've just gotten tickets, even though I saw a screener. I want to see it again with, with a live group of people. It's a great discussion starter, I think, for some of the ideas in Lewis's life. And so, you know, uh, as I uh, said with my interview with Max, take your friends, go out to coffee afterwards or something, you know, because you'll want to talk about some of this, uh, including the argument over the origins of reason. Um, and yeah. if you happen to be interested in digging deeper into Lewis's views on science, materialism, Darwinism, more, I'd also encourage you to go to our website, cslewisweb.com. That's cslewisweb.com. It features some of my essays and works and uh, three documentaries you'll find on YouTube about Lewis on scientism uh, and design and nature and other issues. That's cslewisweb.com.